I want to go back over this whole SSL thing. All right, so how many people have been watching the news? How many people have heard of a program called PRISM? How many people are aware that everything that you do, whether it's a corporate network or not, is basically going to be tapped one way or the other? All right, so that's basically the idea. And you see what everybody's watching what Google and Yahoo's doing right now? They're actually encrypting data in transport between the data centers because the lines have been tapped. So learning how to do SSL is probably going to be one of the more important skills for Linux that you guys are going to learn because companies are starting to go to internally encrypted traffic. And it kind of has its payoff. It's hard to monitor if you're a bad guy or an internal person or something else. It's also really hard to monitor if you're the security team because that means you have to have everyone's certificates. So that just made that certificate server the most important thing on the network to take out, right? So when you guys are cutting your certificates, right, you're seeing that it drops a couple of files in the SSL directory that we have you guys make. But one of the things I keep on getting a question on is how does this command actually work when we do sudo? What does sudo mean? I need to run this as root, right? Open SSL. All right, OpenSSL is the program that calls the crypto suite to make a self-signed certificate. All right? If you're doing public key encryption inside a company, right, on Linux, the package you're going to use is mostly OpenSSL unless you buy something from RSA. Right? Unless you buy a commercial package, you're going to use the open freeware version of Secure Sockets Layer. So basically, that's what it is. It's a program that's Shareware, it's an SSL program, right? So you would use your certificates with SSH, you can use your certificates with Apache, you can use these certificates with OpenVPN. If no one's ever played with that, it's really kind of a neat program, right? So there's lots of w different ways that these certificates can be used. It can even be used in a program called Sambo, which you guys will get in 217, to kind of encrypt that Microsoft traffic. So if you have your Microsoft network on Kerberos, you can cut the certificate in OpenSSL so that your Linux network can talk encrypted via Samba to your Microsoft network. All right, and that way we kind of don't leave any holes open for people to, to monitor and watch what we've got going. All right. Then we want to require minus X509. X509 is basically the directory structure for inside that certificate, right? X509 is a really, really, really old protocol. Right? When you take a look at an OU, when you take a look at anything in Active Directory or an LDAP, that's based on the X509 protocol. And that's where we get that nice little pop-up of where we are, who we are, what company we belong to, because we're making an organizational unit for that particular certificate. All right, so we're going to use X509 because it's really standard across LDAP and Active Directory and anything that has an organizational hierarchy. Right? How many days we want this thing to be good? So we're just going to say for a year, 365. Some keys, if you're in the military, get changed every day. Some keys, if you're working on a really super secret program, get changed every couple of minutes. When you guys are in 166 and you guys were looking at Google, do you remember how that TLS frame would change every five minutes? That means those keys renegotiated every five minutes whenever you're working with Google. All right? So TLS is another form of security, transport layer security. All right. So if we set it to 365 days, we're going to take that risk that I can go a whole year on this key without it being compromised. The more paranoid you are, the shorter the duration of the key. All right. So if you want this key to be only good for one day, you'd say days equals one. Days just one. All right. And then we want to cut a new key, and we want to base it on the RSA algorithm, and we want our key strength to be 2048 bits. All right? So that's kind of a weak key nowadays. <laughs> right? 2048 bits is kind of a weak key nowadays, which is a really sad thing to say. Right? Especially when you take a look at what's going on in other countries, like France, you can't have a key length more than 56 bits, where this is 2048 bits. All right? So if you believe that your key is going to be good for a year at this size, then you can do this. It depends on how paranoid you are or how much that data needs to be protected. Right? If you're doing bleeding edge intellectual property for Microsoft, your keys change daily. If you're just a holding pattern for a news company 
and it's the archives, sure, your key can last a year or longer because then I don't have to worry about it. So 2048 bits. Then I want to push the key out, right? I want to drop it somewhere, space, and I want to drop it into the Etsy Apache 2, if I can spell, SSL, and I want to name it Apache.key, right? Because we're dropping the key, and, and a PKI certificate actually has three parts. A CER file to work with Microsoft, a PEM file to work universally across most systems, and then a key file, right? And that key file is just another format for the key, right? So we're going to write our key out to this directory, and we're going to call it Apache.key, right? And then we just want a normal output, right? So we want it to also drop in, in Etsy, Apache to SSL, and then we just want the universal CRT, so we're just going to call it Apache.CRT, right? CRT files are universal. When you get files from other systems, they're going to come in other different formats, and you can actually convert these formats over using a program called PuttyGen, all right? And you'll learn about that as you kind of go along in the program. So if you need to convert your key from one format to another format, you can actually convert from one format to another format without any issues. But that's basically it. We need to be root. My crypto package and where all the logic and all the math comes from is going to be OpenSSL, right? I want to use X509 because that's the hierarchy that I'm going to see in Active Directory and LDAP and Samba and a lot of the other programs. I want it to last 365 days and I want to make a new key. I want it to be RSA algorithm 2048-bit key size, right? And then I want a key out and then just a regular key. So I want my Apache key, and then I want my Apache.crt file. Does it make sense? Kind of, sort of, maybe? And then you just hit enter. All right, and it's going to ask you for your password. And then when it drew that line, when it did the dots and the pluses, that's your 2048-bit key. It generates it on what's called entropy. And basically what it's doing is pulling the clock off your computer and saying, okay, here's my initial prime number the time, the day, down to the millisecond. And then that's my initial number, and it just cut the key. All right, so your key is already cut. So, enter a new PEM passphrase. If we don't want to enter a passphrase, you don't have to. All right, if you want, if you want this key to be protected by a password, this is where you put it in. If you do not want it to be protected by a password, just hit the enter key. All right. Make sense? All right. Huh? Um, it depends on what you're going to use it for. If you're going to use it for administrative purposes and you know that your scripts are going to be running when you're not there, don't use a passphrase. If you're going to be there and you only want this script or that key to be used while you are physically present, then use a passphrase. It all depends on what you're going to use the key for. Hold on, please. I'm sorry, what? No, 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 you were going. It depends on what you're going to use it for. If you're running an automated backup routine at 2 o'clock in the morning, right, if your job entails that or your job requires an automated script at some unusual time, Right? and you know it's just going to be automated and you don't want to have to worry about it, it's going to fire off on some server that you are the only one that has access to, then that would be a perfectly acceptable use for having a key without a passphrase. If you are going to back up or run a script or do some kind of program where you want to be there or you have to be there, like you're backing up all the legal files, right? and you only want them done at noon when everyone's gone to lunch and you're going to be there because these are the legal files for the company, they're really super secret, then you want to make sure that you use a passphrase so that you know that you are the person that's going through at that time. And it kind of leaves that nice chain of custody, right? If you're going to run an automated process, then you don't need a passphrase. If you want to have more positive control over what you're doing, then you would use a passphrase. It just all depends on what you're going to use it for. It does. Mm -hmm. Every time uh, he logs in to the system or saves something, it does this. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the military has gone to a key ident card. It's got a little smart chip on it. And inside that smart chip is the PEM, CRT, and KEY keys for that specific person while they're in the military. Microsoft does the same thing. You have to have a smart card to plug into the keyboard before you can even log in because it uses something I know, my username and password, and something I physically have, two-factor authentication. I have to physically have that key card, otherwise I'm not getting in there too well. Right? If you change the keys every two minutes, You have to be able to transact the key right. back and forth across the VPN. So if this is randomly generating keys, or are they, are they bought up and um, generated over and over again, but this program has to have the same key. So do these, do these programs have a pattern that they follow? Do they have the same type of bot? Okay, so if I have box A over here in New York and I have box C over here in San Francisco, both will have their separate keys and then they'll negotiate what that cipher stream is gonna be between the two computers based on the content of those keys. When we use the public key, when we use the private key. They don't need to know what each other is, they just have to be able to negotiate to each other what that key is gonna be. When you get into a Cisco router kind of situation, the VPNs will automatically negotiate that key on first instantiation when they first start up. And you can actually watch that over Wireshark, it's really kind of neat, right? Or if you go out to Google and you watch how it instantiates that key exchange for TLS, right? There's that, they don't need to know about each other's keys because they can share a pre-negotiated key or they can negotiate the, the encryption stream using their own crypto. It would make it easier to break, but you're never gonna pull their private key on from either side out of that data stream because they're negotiating a separate unique key for the duration of that transaction. Yeah, you could also communicate with them by generating your own. You might not have access to the same key. Yeah. So if he was a man in the middle, he was Man in the middle, yeah. Yeah, no, man in the middle is a completely different tactic in terms of how that key terminates, right? You would want, there's a whole long process about man in the middle when it comes to that. So it's not like a 10 minute conversation, <laughs> right? My question is to what you were saying is that you're talking about with the router. The router is its own protocol. In this particular case of man, it this particular protocol from this box to this box. Mm, okay, so when you set this key up in Apache, what you're doing is you're providing a public-private key pair to Apache to then someone comes through on their Firefox browser, they have their own public-private key pair. Apache has its own private-public key pair. When you come over that uh, connection via Firefox to that Apache server, it negotiates what cipher stream they're going to use based on those two cipher suites. So that negotiation is actually a third crypto suite or a crypto process based on what I've got here for a crypto key and based on what I've got on the server for the crypto key. So each connection that comes through that Apache server from Firefox to Apache or from Chrome, each of those is handled as a different encrypted transaction. Does that make more sense? Okay. If that's where they store off the keys. Keys can be stored off anywhere on the hard drive, or they can be in Microsoft. They recommend that you store your keys in the registry, so they're harder to grab at. Um, you can do a general pool. You can have a key server that the, then Apache will go back to the key server, pull a key, and then negotiate. There's lots of different architectures in here, right? And most people don't leave their keys on the server because that's just an invite. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, that's only if you home your your web pages out of the Etsy Apache 2 directory. So if you have Etsy Apache 2 www, 
then that's a security issue. You really want to have it underneath var www. But for operational things like SSL and sites available and HTTP configuration, all that stuff considered core to how Apache functions, and it's okay for your crypto to be there, right? But you don't want your operational pages, the stuff you're actually serving to customers, to be inside Etsy Apache www. All right, and then you had a question, sir. What was it? Ah, yeah, we put it Okay. So that's an operational issue. We'll come back to that. We'll debug it. Anton, did you have a question? I need to what? Uh, when it asks you to create that key, mm -hmm. it asks you for the pass, uh, passphrase. Yes. I think you uh, need that for it to work when it, you do it without it. It doesn't create those files at all. It the key. Okay. We'll, co we'll circle around on that one. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, you guys fairly comfortable with this? Yes, sir. Hold on, don't, don't press any buttons. Let's see what we got here. Spaces. Spaces. Spaces will always kill you. All right, so remember your spacing, right? When you're typing in the command line, remember your spacings between words. Otherwise, things get really kind of hairy and the program won't run right. All right, so any other questions? Are we good? Okay, so let's carry on smartly. There's three different technical issues and we'll kind of deal with those with the people. All right, so are we good? You guys are more comfortable with whole how SSL and why we want it and why it's becoming really the industry standard to be doing this across the entire infrastructure from desktop to server, to inter process communications between data centers, and we can all thank our friends at no such agency. All right, and again, this is really becoming a hot button issue on how interception happens. It's an internet feature. They just won't give me back my password that I forgot. There are, whenever you come up and do something, there's always a way around it and encrypting everywhere is really becoming an issue. I mean, a really huge issue. The IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, is actually recommending that everybody go to encrypt it all the time, right? And changing your keys really, really fast, like every 10 to 15 minutes, especially on the bulk fiber long hauls between continents, right? And that, you know, there's a large amount of computational overhead on that, and I'm not too sure it's going to work given how I know how splitting is going on. But, you know, it's better than nothing. It's, it's what we got. All right, so is everybody else good? All right, I'm going to go ahead and save this off so we've got this really nice video of what we got. All right.